Well, today we're continuing a series we've been studying for a few weeks called Broken. Anybody enjoying Broken so far? We've been having a good time. And of course, we've defined broken as reduced to fragments, not functioning properly, and out of working order or dysfunctional. And we've talked about the fact that that might just describe some of our families. Uh, We may, uh, maybe someone in here is a a struggling single. Maybe somebody's marriage is on the cusp of divorce. Some people are dealing with rebellious teenagers. Some are dealing with nosy in-laws. I mean, so many people have issues that they're facing right now in their marriages and, and in their families. And I want you to know that if that is you, God can fix your family. That God can take you from ashes to beauty, as the Bible says. That your circumstances can change, your feelings can change, that there is hope for your future. God can actually take your family life and make it one of the best parts of your life. And so what we've been doing in this series is really showing you how to work with God so that he can do that, showing you the Bible solutions to the family problems that so many of us are facing. And a couple weeks ago, we started off by just talking to our singles. We talked about how God wants us to live our lives free of sexual sins. We don't have broken hearts. And last week, we talked about why some people are still single even though they want to be married. And if you weren't here for either one of those, you can always catch up with those messages online. Today, we're going to go a different direction with this. So we have a video that I want you to watch. Hey, hon, how's your day? I'm tired. It was long and stressful. I was in back-to-back meetings since 7 a.m. this morning. It's just so much, I, I just don't even want to talk about it right now. Did you get a chance to go mail that letter for me? Ah! Oh, uh, you know what? I forgot about it, but is tomorrow good? I promise I'll get it done. Tomorrow. No, tomorrow's too late. I really needed it done today. I only asked you to do this one thing for me, and you didn't do it, so I figured it out. But I'm a little thirsty right now, so I'm going to go get something to drink. What? She just going to walk away? I mean, I got stuff to do. I got a job. Just because I work from home don't mean I have stuff to do. Everything's an emergency. I can fix most things. It's plenty of time to do the stuff. The mail gets there one day later. It'll get there. I just don't know what else to do. It's like, you know, I got two kids, but it's like I got three. I always got to give instruction, direction, follow up. Just, can you just do one thing that I asked you to do? Just because she go out, she make a little more money, but that's okay. She gonna need me. I'm so thirsty. I just want some water. <sighs> For real, this guy, Gary, this is what you leave me? Some empty water? You know I'll be thirsty. Let me get some milk. Oh, I can't even believe this too. You left me this little bit of milk. Yep, it is almost out. I was gonna get some this morning, but I just got tied up in this. But as soon as I get done, this, I will, I will run out and get it immediately, okay? Oh my goodness, I always go in there to empty cartons and pop bottles that he drank out of. It's always something empty in the refrigerator. I just can't have anything to myself. So I left a little a half empty bottles in there a couple times. You know, but when we was first married, she happily picked up my socks and underwear and never said a word. Not 20 some years later, every time I do something, it's an issue. Every time I forget something, it's an issue. Brother need a break. I'm out here hustling. I'm working hard. I come home every day. So she don't have no flaws. See, I don't bring them up because, you know, the, the, don't the words say something about, like, forgive your brother's faults? I forgive hers, but she don't never forgive mine. I hear about them all the time. This movie's so good. Did you see that? Yeah, it was funny. You're not watching. It's good. Come on, we've been waiting for a long time to watch this movie. It's it's a good way. We unwinding. We just relaxing. I am. I'm I'm relaxing watching this movie. I know. I mean, but we got it. It's on demand. We can watch this anytime. All I wanted to do was just watch a movie. Just one time. Watch a movie. But every single day, all he wants to do is have sex. Come on, I am tired. I came in the door tired. Oh my God. He just has a stupid cold word that he likes to use when he want to get frisky. Let's unwind. What is that? Let's unwind is the key word that unlocks satisfaction. She know what that time is. Aren't you hot with this sweater on? No, I'm not hot with my sweater. You know I'm not hot. Oh. 
Oh my God, he's always just touching me and grabbing me and just, just leave me alone. I'm always ready. She never, she always tired. You know, it's this high powered job. I told her, you know, she need to relax a little. Like we need to enjoy our time together. No kids in the house. You know, this should, this should be, you know, part, this should be some stuff happening here. I'm 50 now. I need, you know, I need, when I'm ready, I'm ready. You know, two days later, it might be a different situation. You know what I'm saying? You can see why we sent the teenager downstairs now. <laughs> so, over the years, you know, I've talked to many couples who've kind of found themselves stuck in a similar situation to what we just watched, but actually a lot worse. In fact, uh, I remember growing up, one of my favorite movies was Top Gun. And, um, you know, I, was, I don't even know how I saw it because I was just like seven, eight years old when it came out. But they had this song that was really popular that they put right in the middle of that movie called You've Lost That Loving Feeling. Anybody remember that song? All right, so a lot of you do. Some of you are saying, I don't know what you're talking about. That's all right. You'll still be with me. Um, and I think that really kind of is a good song for it. That's probably like a theme song for some people's marriages. And that, you know, the love just isn't there anymore. That instead of being lovers, you're basically just roommates. Meaning there is no romance. There is no sex life. Uh, there is no spark. And because of that, some people are even broken. Because they look at their marriage and it's just not what they want. It's not what they need. And that might be a result of the past actions of one or the other. Uh, spouse that might be the result of uh, just life kind of seeming to conspire against the marriage, you know, the kids, the job, taking care of mom and dad, or, you know, some type of tragedy that happened. That could be the result of somebody just simply not seeing having a great marriage uh, as a priority. But I want you to know that if, that's, if this describes your marriage, you can fall in love again. I'm going to say it again. You can fall in love again. You absolutely can. And I want to take the next couple of weeks and show you how to do that. So I'm going to start in Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 5. And here is Solomon's wife speaking. She says, oh, give me something refreshing to eat and quickly, apricots, raisins, anything. I'm about to faint with love. The New King James Version says, I am love sick. Well, she's talking about her relationship with her husband, Solomon. And she's saying, I'm love sick. You know, we, when we talk about being sick uh, in this way, it's probably because we're dealing with a little too much. I mean, I know for me and my sister, one of the things that we still remember to this day is when we were, we were kids, uh, one, one Christmas my parents, for whatever reason, had a truckload of candy corn in the house. And we both love candy corn. And we just kept eating it. I mean, we went well beyond what we should have eaten. To the place where we both got sick. And to this day, I can't stand the sight of candy corn. I think she might be the same way. I mean, you get sick because you eat too much. Well, that's kind of what she's saying here. She's saying, I'm having, I have so much love. I'm I'm enjoying this relationship so much that I'm kind of love sick. I've almost had too much. She's describing her marriage. And in Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 19, it says this. God's talking to the man, and he's talking to him about his wife and why he should just focus on his wife and not mess around with other women. And he says, a loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always May you ever be intoxicated with her love. So God is saying, I want you to be intoxicated with her love, not somebody else's love. But notice that he's describing what he wants for that man in that marriage. And once again, if you're intoxicated, doesn't that mean you had a little bit too much? Right? You've been drinking a little too much. That's why you're drunk. He's saying, I want you to have so much of love. I want you to enjoy your relationship with your wife so much that you're kind of drunk in love. And he didn't, and notice he said here, I want you to ever be intoxicated, to always be satisfied. So he's not saying, I want you just to experience this once or twice. I want this just to happen when you're, you're a newlywed, 
No, he's saying this is something that should be your constant experience. This should describe your marriage. It should be one where you are intoxicated with each other's love. He's intoxicated with her love. She's lovesick because of his love. So notice here that what we can see is that this is really what God thinks of when he talks about marriage. When God talks about marriage, he's thinking about a woman who is lovesick, who really enjoys being with her husband, and a man who was drunk in love with his wife. When he thinks about marriage, he thinks about the fact that this is really why I gave her to him and him to her so they could have this experience the rest of their lives. Ecclesiastes verse 9, chapter 9 and verse 9, he tells the husband, live joyfully with the wife of your youth. Live joyfully. I want you to live a joyful life with her. Proverbs 31 and verse 12 talks about how the wife would do her husband good all the days of his life. And even in Deuteronomy 24, the Bible talks about God getting the marriage off on the right foot by the man cheering up his wife. I mean, what you can get from all of this is that when God thinks about the marriage relationship, he thinks about it being great the entire marriage, not just great in a season. What are you trying to say, Pastor? God wants you to be in love with your spouse, not just to love them, but to be in love to be lovesick, to be drunk in love with your spouse all the days of your life together. So the question becomes then, how do we do that? How do I go from maybe where I am right now where we barely can stand aside of each other? Or, you know, we, 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 we're, we get along, but we, we're not really in love anymore to the place where we're lovesick and we're intoxicated with each other's love. I want to give you three things today. Number one, make a great marriage a priority. Somebody say great marriage. Make a great marriage a priority. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, we, we actually read about God bringing the first man and the first woman together. In fact, what you read there is that God creates the man, gives him a purpose, a job. Then, of course, God looks at the man and says, it's not good that he's alone. I'm going to create a help meet for him. He's talking about the wife. She's someone that's adaptable to him, someone that's suitable to him, somebody that can help him because men need help. I, I, thank you for those two amens. So God, of course, as the Bible teaches, created, creates the woman and brings her to the man. And so we have the first wedding in history. It's in the Garden of Eden. And we have the first marriage in history. And then God really declares an ordinance. In verse 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. It starts with the word therefore. In other words, what we just read uh, is something that, that's leading into this. It, it, it has uh, an impact on what I'm about to say. And what God is saying is what I did with Adam and Eve is a picture of what should happen with every man and woman that are entering a marriage relationship. That that man should leave his father and his mother and that he should cleave to his wife. That word cleave means to stick to, to impinge, to chase after. It's referring to the relationship and also sex as well. And they shall be one flesh. So God is basically saying this is how this is supposed to work. So now let's back up for a moment. Isn't this the first human relationship in the Bible? Right before this, there was no human relationship. It was just Adam and God. But then God brings Eve on the stage and immediately causes them to be married. And then talks about how this should work from here on out. In other words, God made marriage the foundation of civilization. It was the very foundation of it. It, it. He really saw marriage as how all of this, all of the earth would be populated, how everything he wanted to accomplish in the earth would occur. And so God considers marriage to be important. 
So much so that even in the New Testament, you'll find scriptures like in 1 Timothy 3 where God's looking at, you know, the qualifications of a man, whether or not he should be allowed to be a bishop. And the first thing he says is the husband of one wife. In Titus, it talks about wives and talks about all the things that, or young women, and it talks about all the things that they should do. And the first thing it talks about is that she loves her husband, even before it says she loves her children, because her husband is supposed to come before her children. In fact, 1 Peter 3, verse 7 really illustrates this. It says, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. God literally just said here that you need to treat your wife right so your prayers aren't hindered. Meaning the most important thing in your life is that marriage. And if you aren't doing right in that marriage, you're not going to be able to hear from God when it comes to your job. You're not going to be able to get healing. You're not going to be able to get the money you need. You're not going to be able to get, you know, that comfort or, or be able to pray for your level. None of that's going to work, God says, if you don't take care of number one, which is your wife. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's a place where the Bible teaches that the people of God were really upset because they were in a famine, and they were doing the same thing that, that they were doing before that caused God to bless them. They were bringing God tithe and offering, and, and God finally said, listen, I'm not taking your offering. And they said, why? He said, because you've been mistreating your wife. And in that case, they were divorcing their wives and marrying younger models. And God's saying, that's not cool with me. So as far as God is concerned, your marriage is a priority. It really is the most important human relationship you have on earth, and God considers you having a, a great marriage a priority. That's why he gave us Song of Solomon in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll look at that later. And all these instructions about marriage, because he doesn't just want you to be married. He wants you to have a great marriage. One where you're lovesick and you're, you're intoxicated with love. One where the husband is respected and the wife is honored. One where people can see the love between you and it leads them to believe in God. God wants you to have a great marriage. And he expects you to have to you for you to make having a great marriage a priority in your life as well. You know, if somebody wants to be a great basketball player, what do they need to do? Well, they've got to prioritize working on their game. Right? You don't just show up and start playing well. Right? You don't just kind of work on your game when you feel like it. You got to make a decision that I'm going to put the time in on my, my game uh, ahead of some of the other things I normally would like to do. The same thing is true when it comes to business or, or, or arts, whatever the case may be. Whatever is most important to you needs to get your attention and your time. And that's the same thing is true concerning marriage. We ought to make our marriages uh, uh, a priority in our lives. Your marriage should not fall beneath your children. It should not fall beneath your, your job or your career. It should not fall beneath uh, 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 your church. It should not fall beneath you serving other people. All those things are important, but biblically, the first priority you ought to have under God is your spouse. They ought to be number one. You ought to be focused on and willing to do what it takes to have a great marriage. Now, think about it like this. Oh, what if your marriage were a third, another person in your home, a separate person? So now you've got this thing in your house, this person, that's your marriage. And if it's healthy, it, it looks healthy and things are great. But if it's neglected, it's sick and, and, and dying. What if that were a child, right? And if, if your marriage were a child, would we have to call, uh, you know, child protection services on you? Because this thing hasn't been fed. This thing, this child hasn't been, there's no clothes. They, they're not, they're, they don't ever have any fun. But God's will is that that, that marriage be coached it be worked on really before any other relationship in your life and at the end and that it ultimately 
be great. God wants you to have a great marriage. And this is why you can't friend zone your husband or your wife. Don't friend zone your husband. Don't friend zone your wife. You can't just be friends. God didn't give them to you to just be your friend. God gave them to you to be the person that, that, that you're in love with. God gave them to, them to you so that you could have a great marriage with them. All right, number two. Y'all real quiet today. I don't know if I'm just messing up or y'all just like, I don't want to hear this. Or, but that's all right. I'm going to keep on preaching it. Y'all stuck now. You can't get up and leave without looking silly. So, <laughs> Number two. Decide to do things God's way. Decide to do things God's way. Psalm 18, verse 30 says this, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. One translation said all of God's promises prove true. He is a shield to all who trust in him. So the Bible's telling us that God's way, that word way means the course of life or the mode of action. Right? So his road that you would travel or his decisions that you should make, uh, his decisions are perfect. God's way always works. God's way is proven to work. The message translation says it this way, what a God. His road stretches straight and smooth. Every God direction is road tested. Everyone who runs toward him makes it. So God's way is the best way. That's the point, right? God's way is the best way to do things. God's way is proven to work. It has worked in the lives of so many people in the world, right? Then Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The message translation says it this way. Look again, it leads straight to hell. So there's a way that we think things should be done. And it looks like it's the best way. But the actual end result of that way is not good. It's death. It it doesn't produce the results that you want. And ultimately, if you live your life following your way instead of God's way, it'll lead you to hell. So the Bible is telling you here that clearly his way is not your way. His way is better than your way. Isaiah 55 says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God's saying, what I think and and, and the way I say things should be done is way better than the way you think things should be done. That's what he's telling us here. And, you know, there are probably some of us in here who who are experts at some things. There are things we do well. Maybe you cook real well. And and so maybe you take somebody in the kitchen. You say, I want to teach you how to do this. And you show them the way to do it. Maybe it's it's one of your kids. And they decide, now I want to try it a different way. I, I don't think I need to turn it on this temperature. I don't need to put this seasoning here. I don't need to. What's going to happen? You, you're going to look at what they make and say, I, I'm, I, I'm not eating that. In fact, I don't think you should eat that. Right? Why? Your way is the better way. It's proven. You've been doing it for years. They're just figuring it out now. And that's how God feels about how some of us, are, some of our marriage philosophy. We've been told all kinds of things about how marriage should work. In fact, the world has its own ideas. And I'm here to tell you, the world's ideas are a mess. That's why the divorce rate is so high. That's why there's so much infidelity, because of the way the world does this. You know, I'm I'm on social media from time to time. I've seen some very interesting conversations, for example, on Twitter, where, you know, somebody would make a basic, st- basic statement about marriage and how a husband's supposed to do this for a wife and a wife for a husband. There'll be an explosion of comments where people are, well, I never do that for my husband. I never do that for my wife. And people have all these crazy ideas, and they wonder why people leave them <laughs> and why their kids don't ever want to be married and all this stuff because they have their own way that simply doesn't work. And what you see on TV doesn't work. What works is God's way. And one thing you've got to decide to do is to put down your way of cooking and pick up God's way of cooking. 
Put down your way of being married and how I'm supposed to treat my husband and how, you know, how I'm supposed to treat my wife and, you know, how this is supposed to happen, what the bedroom is supposed to be like and what is romance supposed to be like and how the money is supposed to be. I'm going to keep a little money under the mattress just because you're an idiot and all that kind of stuff. You got you to gotta put all that stuff down. And you got to decide to pick up God's way. When you pick up God's way, what you'll find is doing things God's way will cause you to fall in love again. Doing things your way will keep things where they are or even make things worse. So number two, you've got to make a decision to do things God's way. When it's all said and done, God's the one who created marriage. Who would know better how it's supposed to work? And then number three, act like you're in love. What? Act like you're in love. You know, I've, I've wondered about this. Obviously, I've got family members that are in, in the movies or actors and actresses, and I won't name them because I'm not trying to name drop. I'm not trying to put them out there like this. But I've seen them in movies, and, and I know who they're married to. They're married to my family members. And yet they act like they're in love with the male in the movie, right? And, you know, and, and do a great job. I'm like, how do you do that? Where, you know, you, 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 know, you sell it, man. If I'm watching this on the screen, I'm almost like, man, my, my, my family member in trouble. Cause... But, and, but, you know, that's what actors do. They, they go out and they, they act like I'm in love. They look at them a certain way. They hold their hands. They hug them. They kiss them. All that kind of stuff. They, they are acting like it. And they do so good at do, do it so well that some of them actually do fall in love while they're shooting the film. How many Hollywood couples have come out of them shooting a film together? Right? And, you know, I'm not saying that you ought to be an actor in, in that sense and just try to pretend. But I am saying that you need to put some action to your faith. James chapter 1 and verse 22 says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. That message translation says it this way, act on what you hear. It's one thing to, to hear God's way of doing things. We're going to talk about some of those things right now. But there's another, it's another thing to actually act on it. If you look at verse 25 of James 1, it says, If you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, if you do, somebody say do, if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Somebody say doing it. Now, the word do, doer here means performer. So God's literally saying be a performer of my words. Do things my way. And if you'll do things my way, you'll be blessed. That's the bottom line, right? The person that's blessed is the one that does things God's way. That word blessed even means to be happy. The person that's happy is the one that does it God's way. Jesus said it this way in John 13. He said, happy are you if you do these things. So God wants you happy, and he's telling you, here's how you do it. You act on what I tell you to do. And one of the things God is telling married couples in here to do is to actually Act like you're in love. Actually be the husband or the wife that God's word teaches that you're supposed to be. So, for example, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 28 says to men, and that is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. No one abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. This is why a man leaves father and mother and cherishes his wife. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself and loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. So notice God is talking to this man, and he's saying, you ought to nourish and cherish your wife. You ought to meet her needs. You ought to value her. So women have different emotional needs. They have a need for affection. They have a need for conversation. They have a need for financial security. They've got a need for their husband to be honest and open with them. If there's kids, they've got a need for the man to be a good father 
to their kids. These are needs, emotional needs. And God is saying, you ought to meet those needs. Cherishing a wife is actually uh, something that is not all that strange to those of us that have daughters because you naturally cherish your daughter, naturally. And God's saying, you know, this is God's daughter. This is my gift to you. You ought to cherish your wife even more, really, than you cherish your daughter. And then in 1 Peter 3, God talks to the woman. He says, when they, talking about husbands, and this is talking about a husband that's not doing right. When they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves, together with your reverence for your husband, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect, defer to, refer him, to, uh, def- to uh, honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in a human sense to adore him. That is to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. So God's saying here, honor him, admire him, prize him. Uh, excuse me, yes, praise him as well. Deeply love him. And I mentioned earlier in Titus 2 how God said wives are to affectionately love their husbands. Now notice something about these scriptures. There is no mention of your feelings. God does not say nourish and cherish her only if you feel like it. He does not say respect and admire and praise him, meet his needs only if you feel like it. What he's telling you here is you are to nourish and cherish her whether you're feeling it or not. Thank you for those two amens. He's saying you ought to respect and affectionately love him whether you're feeling it or not. This has nothing to do with your feelings. This has to do with obeying God's way of doing things. Nothing to do with your feelings. And and so, you know, I like to work out. And like most people, there are days I feel like working out and there are days that I don't. Anybody said the same thing is true about you, right? And, and, and those days that I don't feel like working out, when I still go ahead and do it, usually somewhere in the middle of the workout, I start enjoying myself. And by the time I'm done, I actually am glad I went to work out, right? And, and, and that's how that works. And that's, that's similar to what God's talking about here in marriage is that we need to act like we're in love. We need to act on what we know is right, whether we feel they deserve it or not, whether we're feeling it or not. And if you'll act on it, what you'll find is that the feelings will come. You will be blessed doing that, just like you will be blessed giving when God says give, praying when God says pray, or doing anything else the Bible says. When you act on it, that's when you'll find that you can fall in love again. I was watching a broadcast a couple weeks ago of, uh, of uh, Nicole Crank on the Victory Network, just a, a man of God and his wife, and, and she had a, a married couple on there. And the, the, the lady in that couple said this. She said, it's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. It's easier to act your way into a feeling than to feel your way into an action. Then another guy said this. I caught him yesterday on social media. He said, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react. Stop feeling your way into acting and start acting your way into feeling. Another individual said this. They said, a great part of the disaster of contemporary life lies in the fact that it is organized around feelings. Think about this. In what area of your life do you get to just not do something just because you don't feel like it? You know, do you just not get to go, you you decide not to go to school because you don't feel like it? Do you just not go to work because I don't feel like it? Do I just not show up on Sunday? One day you come up in here and where's Pastor Andre? He ain't feel like it today. (laughs) How about paying your bills? I, I don't feel like it. 
Where are you going to end up? On the street. How about working out? I don't feel like it. Where are you going to end up? With an extra 20 pounds you didn't want to have. I mean, come on. We start thinking about it. What area of your life do, do you allow, are you allowed to allow your feelings to be the boss and get good results? And why would it be any different in marriage? Why would it be any different? You cannot let your feelings be the boss of your marriage. And this is sometimes really an issue for women. It is for men too. But I was talking to a friend of mine one day, and he said something that was really profound. And he was saying, you know, men's problem, men will ruin their lives over sex. And women will ruin their lives over their feelings. Men can't seem to see past their sexual desire, and women can't seem to see past their feelings, and they blow up their life over. And so I saw, it's so interesting to me, while I was meditating this one day, I was looking at this, and I'm saying, God doesn't say anything here about feelings. Nothing. Nothing. He just simply says, you do your part. Focus on meeting their needs. Nourish them, cherish them, love them, be good to them. And you'll be blessed because you do it. So you got to give God something to work with. You can't say, God, save my marriage. God, make things great. But then you won't, you won't work with them. It's like jumping in the car and saying, car, take me home. But you won't even turn the car on. You won't put the car in drive. You won't put, you know, you can't, you gotta give them something to work with. And if you you will, if you'll do things God's way and you'll stick with it, he'll cause you to fall in love again. Let's go a step farther with this. God's word reveals that you ought to be having sex regularly, whether you're feeling it or not. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Pastor, I don't know about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now, regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. The King James Version says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. What's he talking about? It's good for someone to stay single their whole life. It's good for someone to, to never have sex. That's what God's saying. And he, he makes that point throughout the entire chapter here in 1 Corinthians. But notice the next thing he says. But because there is so much sexual immorality, I think the King James Version does an even better, one, better uh, job with this. It says to avoid fornication. A couple weeks ago we talked about how dangerous Fornication is, sexual sin is. So God says to avoid, to avoid sexual sin, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's sexual needs. So God's saying, I don't want you to commit sexual sin. So what I'm going to do is give you a husband or a wife so that need is met. Because I don't want you to commit sexual sin because it's that dangerous. God's answer to your sex drive is marriage. Thank you for those amen. I can see I'm, I'm all by myself today. So <laughs> y'all ain't helping, y'all ain't pulling. So I'm just going to put it out here. I'm going to go home and watch the game and eat something and, and feel comfortable. I did my job today. I don't know about y'all, but no. Let me keep reading. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. When did that happen? On the wedding day, right? The husband gives authority over his body to his wife. When did that happen? On the wedding. As far as God is concerned, her body belongs to him now. His body belongs to her now. Let's see, some folks getting all because that's not how the world thinks. It's the complete opposite of where the world is. But God's saying, this is what marriage is. This is why the term sexless marriage is an oxymoron. If there's no sex in the marriage, there is no marriage. That's not marriage. When God started this thing in Genesis chapter 2, he called it one what? Flesh. He said, the man will leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one 
flesh. And you notice how even how marriage was consummated then and it's supposed to be consummated now. It's through sex. God, one of the reasons why God created marriage also was so that people could have children. But how does that happen? Through sex. If there's no sex, that's not marriage. So much so in the, in, in the book of Exodus. I won't take it there for time's sake. But, you know, God allowed man to get away with some things for a while while he was moving, getting toward, getting closer and closer to Jesus coming. And so he has some rules. In Exodus chapter 21, he talks about a man who marries a woman and then later decides to marry a second woman. And I mean, no, that's not God's will now. So don't come out of here talking about, hey, pastor talked about a scripture in the Bible where you can have a second. No, no. He allowed that for a season, but now he's where, where he wants us to be. But, and he talks about there, though. He says, man, if this man is married to a woman and he marries a second woman, then he is to provide for this first woman everything the way he did before. She's still supposed to have the same amount of clothing. She's still supposed to have the same type of food. She's still supposed to have the same amount of sex. And he says, if he stops giving her any of those three, she is released from the marriage. She can leave. If God were to apply that today, <laughs> you think the divorce rate is high now. And I think you see the church divorce rate go through the roof. Because for some reason, singles are having a bunch of sex and marriage aren't having enough. In churches. Y'all already mad at me, so I'm just going to be real. No, that's an oxymoron. He goes on to say, do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain, unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give, you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. So notice he's saying that it is, there is a place for having a sex fast but that's something you both agree to, and it's simply so that you can spend more time in prayer. And the longest time you ever saw a sex fast in the Bible was three days. Amen. Notice he didn't say so that somebody, because somebody had a headache or they wanted to watch their favorite TV show or all these other reasons. Come on, I'm just reading to you. I'm read, am I reading the Bible to y'all? Am I reading the Bible? Right? This is just God. When God created marriage, he said, this is how marriage is supposed to work. No wonder so many people's marriages are broken. Afterwards, you should come together again so that, so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Remember how this started. I don't want you in sexual sin, so I've given you your spouse. They're your gift so you can have sex with them. And he ends it by saying, I want you to make sure you're coming together regularly so you're not even tempted to commit sexual sin. God said, I don't want that man or that woman in the temptation zone ever because I don't want to give Satan even an, an opening to get them into sexual sin and to ruin their life and the lives of other people. And notice he also said here, because of your lack of of self-control. If you were to jump down to verse 9, I, I didn't give it to you guys, but he, he talks about how it's good to stay unmarried. But he said, because we lack self-control, it's better to marry than to be aflame with passion and tortured continually with ungratified desire. It's better to marry if you can't control yourself than it is to burn with lust. So God is saying, you can't handle it. You can't handle that married person. That's why, and that's why I gave you that husband. That's why I gave you that wife. And I, I, I don't want you sitting around burning with lust. And, and that's why some singles in here, I'm just going to go here. Some of you have been waiting on the Lord, and it ain't you waiting on the Lord. And you're like, I don't know why I, I'm always dealing with this. and these, I, I don't know why I can't ever get married. And it ain't, it ain't the Lord. God sent you somebody. And you kept passing them up. And now you're struggling with your sex drive. Well, he sent you to answer. Thank you for that one amen. We're going to burn this message later, right? So God is saying, you know, here, here's a couple things. This is God's way of marriage. This is what marriage looks like. And this is... The opposite of 
what we typically think. I would say even in church. So I'm not trying to be critical of anybody, so I'm not going to say any names. But I know I was at an event recently, and I heard, you know, a husband and wife talk, and they were talking about this issue. And the wife spent all this time on all these things you need to do to create an environment for her to want to have sex with her husband. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is a key to having great sex. But I'm sitting here this whole time going, man, we really got this thing backward. Because we are acting like the man needs to earn sex when he earned it when he said, I do. Come on, we said no ringy, no thingy. Right? Some of y'all grew up in church. You know what I'm talking about? No ringy, no thingy. Put a ring on it, right? All that stuff. Then he give you the ringy, and he still get no thingy while you spend all the money. Got no problem spending the money, but you don't want to give up the thingy. He got to do all these things before you even feel like. When 1 Corinthians 7, notice we read all those scriptures and none of it said anything about how you feel. None of it. You didn't have to feel like you're in the middle of the notebook or a Tyler Perry movie, whatever it came, before you decided to sleep with your husband or your wife. God's simply saying this is what you're supposed to do. Act like you're in love. And this is where the world says, you know, we're drifting apart, so that's why we don't have sex. And God says, you don't have sex, that's why you're drifting apart. And it's true. It's true. I ran across an article yesterday, or just this morning, actually. The Lord really had me look this up. And um, it was talking about what they call the love hormone, oxytocin. And one, one, of course, study or one article talked about that when two people have sex, oxytocin is released, and that helps bond the relationship. It creates an emotional bond between two people. But there's another article I found on WebMD, and they said a couple of things here that really jumped out at me. They actually did this study, and the, the idea of the study was to try to figure out, you know, why men are monogamous, why men don't just, you know, they feel like naturally how the world thinks. Naturally, it will be better for a man to have multiple partners, right? So why would a guy stay with the one woman? And what they found was that uh, oxytocin played a major role in that, that when the man and the woman were together, not just having sex, but even just hugging and holding hands as well as having sex, that oxytocin would be released, and it would strengthen their social bond together. It was so strong that they, in this study, what they did was they took pictures of the wife, and then they brought pictures of other women that were of equal attraction, and they would show those pictures to the, to the man, and the man would always choose his wife. She was always the most attracted to him. The, the pleasure centers in his brain would light up more when he would look at his wife. In fact, they would go down when he would see other women because he has created this bond with her through oxytocin. So then they said a few things here. It says, an expert who was not involved in the study said that the results suggest that couples who keep a high level of intimacy in their relationships can maintain stronger bonds. When you're first becoming intimate, you're releasing lots of dopamine and oxytocin. That's creating a link between your neural systems. Goes on to say, as time goes on and couples become less intimate, that linkage can decay. But activities that release oxytocin, such as really looking into one another's eyes, holding hands, kissing, and having sex may help restore the connection. To me, it suggests that it may be a way to help prevent the decay that can occur that leads couples to separate. One other individual said, I think this is the only reason why we do hug and touch each other all the time because it actually keeps our oxytocin levels high in relationships. What is he telling you here? Just to real basic way of saying this. When you are affectionate and you have sex, you 
love each other more. Not natural, not spiritually. I'm talking about a natural human love. It releases a hormone called oxytocin that makes you feel like you're in love. When you stop doing that, you stop feeling like you're in love. So you can imagine then that when you're in a marriage relationship and there's no affection and there's no sex, no wonder you don't feel like I'm in love. That's a scientific study, but we started with the Bible. And the Bible tells us when I do what God says, I'm blessed. I mean, I'm going to feel lovesick and intoxicated with, with love. When I decide to do the opposite, then I'm going to create the opposite result. And this thing can completely spiral out of control. Simply because I'm not obeying God's way of doing this. This is telling us here that having regular sex with your spouse helps you fall in love again. And this is one reason why God wants you to have sex and why the Bible talks about it a lot. I mean, the book of Song of Solomon alone is just full of stuff. Because God understands that that actually causes your marriage to, to be strong. Let me go a step farther with this then. Can you see why it's wrong to force your spouse into celibacy? You know, that, that's what happens in some cases where, you know, one spouse understands this, is ready to roll. The other one's like, hey, I, I'm, I'm whatever, whatever, whatever reason. You know, that's, that's sin. It's just as much sin as smoking and drinking and gambling and doing drugs. Because God said, I gave you to them to meet their needs, to protect them from sexual sin. I, I, want this, I, I want you to have this relationship where you're together, you know, emotionally, you're together physically, you're together spiritually, and you pulled away and you left them in this temptation zone. And so, and, and most likely when that happens, there's going to be some sexual sin. Because that's what God was trying to avoid. And when they end up judged, you're going to get judged too. It'll be just as much your fault as it was. See, we've got to get past this idea that my feelings rule everything. When God thinks about marriage, he thinks about actions. He thinks about marriage being uh, op operate in the way everything else does in this kingdom, which is you operate in unconditional love. No matter who they are, what they've done, if you believe this is who God wants me to be with, then you are nourishing, you're cherishing, you're respecting, you're, you're affectionately loving, you are having sex together, you're enjoying each other, trusting that as we do this, God will help us heal from whatever's happened in the past. God will help us to fall in love again. When it's all said and done, it really simply comes down to one thing. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, reads in this way, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That's what it says. That both you and your descendants may live. When it's all said and done, falling in love again is a choice. I'm going to say it again. It's simply a choice. You can choose to make having a great marriage a priority. You can choose to do things God's way. You can choose to act like I'm in love, and you'll find the feelings that come back. It may not happen overnight, but they will. You'll find you'll be in love again. Or you can choose, I don't want to do those things for whatever reason. Doesn't matter the reason. And you'll find that you'll stay where you are, or even worse, you may not end up together anymore. I just want to challenge you today to do things God's way. Choose to fall in love again and experience the amazing future God has for you all together for the rest of your lives.